Welcome everybody on behalf of the University of York to the latest in our series of virtual tours of cities and locations around the UK. Um, this evening's tour is being conducted by Peter Elmer, who has been a friend of the University of York for many years and has conducted many in-person tours for the York Global Alumni Association London Group, particularly around London and Essex. Peter is the published author of two books of guided walks, one on London and one in Essex, both of which are available through Cicerone um, and are definitely worth getting your hands on if you can. Uh, we're extremely grateful to Peter for volunteering his time this evening to provide this presentation for us. Um, his, as I say, his walks that he does for the university are always incredibly popular um, and sell out very, very quickly. Uh, I'm delighted that we're able to have so many more guests join us this evening, although of course we regret that we're not able to meet in person. Um, but fortunately, doing it virtually does mean that we'll have so many more people who are able to take advantage of Peter's excellent guide skills. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Peter to begin the virtual Harlow Sculpture Tour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyla. And uh, it's uh, wonderful to have um, so many people um, on uh, on a virtual tour, far more than I can manage um, at any other, in any other way. Um, those of you who have been on my uh, York Alumni London walks will know that we've been in the 20s and 30s, which is quite a lot for a walk. Um, uh, and it, however, it's nothing like the uh, 100 or so I think we've got tonight, which is, which is great. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to introducing you uh, to uh, Harlow, the uh, first sculpture town that uh, Britain possesses. It's proud of its designation uh, and, and justly so. And yet in many ways, it's an unlikely site for uh, um, uh, a location with so much public uh, sculpture. Uh, it's a new town. Uh, many of you will know that those were created after the Second World War in a ring around London in the 1950s. Um, uh, there was further waves of new towns, but that's a study all of its own. Uh, Harlow is in Essex, about 22 miles from uh, London. Um, it took people mostly from north and east London. Uh, it became a town of 50 or 60,000, uh, but it became a, the town that it was because of the vision of its master planner, Frederick Gibbard. Um, Gibbard had already become famous before the war as a modernist architect, one of the first in the, uh, in the nation. Uh, this was his first uh, significant work, Pullman Court in South London. Uh, it's still there. He became known as the Flats Architect because of it. That's somewhat unfortunate because he built very few blocks of flats, including in Harlow itself. There was later to be only a single residential block of flats. Almost everything else was, uh, was low rise. Um, during the war, he um, uh, undertook uh, a, a town planning qualification, became president of the Architectural Association. He was medically unfit for service, so he was in London the whole time. And he was identified as one of uh, those architects, town planners, who could take on the task of designing a new town pretty much from scratch. Now, many of you will have seen what we call the pre-read, uh, a set of notes that describe that process in a little bit greater detail. If you haven't seen it, you will receive it later. If I talk about that too much now, we'll run far too far over. Um, alongside his work in Harlow, um, he, he designed many other significant buildings um, in that immediate post-war period, including all what was then all of Heathrow Airport. Uh, that's the Queen's building at Heathrow, but he designed the other three terminals of the day as well. Um, he designed a Catholic cathedral in Liverpool. Uh, he designed Coote's Bank on the Strand. Those of you that know Central London will know this is a very, very delicate site in many ways. Uh, almost adjacent to Trafalgar Square, opposite Charing Cross Railway Station, major thoroughfare. 
Um, and he did that by putting quite a lot of plate glass in between two uh, extant, um, much older facades. Uh, keep the Coots Bank image in your head as far as you can, because you might wonder what was there before. Well, we, we, will, we will be able to find out, I'm pleased to say. But significant figure, uh, eventually was knighted for his services to architecture. Or as he would say, he saw himself more as a landscape architect, always concerned with how buildings worked in their location and hence got uh, the opportunity to work on the master plan for Harlow. Um, to do that, he had a walk, went for a walk uh, around the site, um, which is mostly open fields. There was a single small town uh, named Harlow, no surprise. Um, there was a uh, uh, stately home, Mark Hall. This is what he saw. He saw the original, I hope you can see the mouse, location of Harlow, which was to become known as Old Harlow. He saw the River Stort, a fairly significant tributary of the River Lee, which itself is a major tributary of the Thames. It's a significant, it's a canal, it's a canalized river now, it's a navigation. So it, it was taking, um, certainly in those times, late 40s, early 50s, was taking canal traffic. It's now mostly pleasure boats. Uh, there's a railway line. Uh, there were a couple of other streams as well, run, one of them running through this area and another running through that, tributaries of the Stalks, which he thought started to compartmentalize the site. So by this task of walking and cycling, he settled on a four zone plan for the town. Um, with the town centre in this area, not in the old area of town, um, and residential areas here, um, here, and essentially in the four quadrants, uh, northwest, southwest, southeast, and northwest, abutting Old Harlow. Uh, the uh, industrial areas were zoned to the north and to the west. Uh, he was able to produce this in less than a year, just as well. He was given 12 months to do it. Uh, the town centre would be brand new uh, and there would be green wedges. This was very much part of his studies in wartime, this concept of green wedges within uh, new architectural developments. Um, all housing therefore would, would be within walking distance of natural landscape. The old road system, which was mostly country lanes, uh, would be repurposed as foot and cycle paths. And the, the black and the dashed lines that you see uh, would be the new road system. Uh, industry out of the way. So uh, he, he saw the major arterial roads of a new arterial road linking London and Cambridge and a new arterial road circling London. We now know them as the M25 and the M11 would be well placed to take that industrial traffic without it going through the town centre. So uh, the, the M25 is, is it in fact roughly there, obviously many years after the um, developments took place. Uh, the London Cambridge motorway is now the other side of town. He was not happy with this um, because uh, all the industrial traffic ended up coming through the town. And that is the case, I'm afraid, to this very day, although belatedly some work is, is, is going on to uh, make sure that uh, that is mitigated. But that was his plan, and that is roughly what you will see now in terms of the map of Harlow, because here's the map of Harlow. Uh, there's, this is the main area of the uh, present um, civic and shopping area of town. A residential district there, northwest, another southwest, um, and so southeast and, and northeast. And there's what we call Old Harlow with its much older buildings. Uh, Mark Hall was the name of the uh, stately home. It was demolished. Um, the owners presumably were made a better offer and it was raised to the ground and no, no shape of it remains. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be taking this walk from the station. We're going to be heading uh, first south 
then north uh, before returning by the river. Um, a diversion to the area known as Mark Hall uh, before we head to Pandon Mill, um, an older place, and back to the station. Now, I can usually um, take my uh, walking groups uh, for York alumni for distances. I think I've been doing about five or six miles. Uh, today, we're going to go and do 14 miles. Um, we're going uh, from the station over to the district of Bush Fair by the town centre. Uh, apologies for the uh, incorrect ster spelling of Sterling Prize. The Sterling Prize is the uh, major prize for British architects and the residential district of Newhall uh, was um, a, a live contender for that very recently. Uh, and then we're going through Old Harlow, you'll see the Gibbard Garden, which is very significant um, as one of the later places that we visit before we return by the river, uh, an excursion to Mark Hall through the town park um, and eventually back to the station. Uh, we'll see this map again, so a couple of times, so you can keep track of where we are on our progress. We're going to start at the station. Uh, there it is. Um, it's new, or at least it was in 1959. Um, now, Gibbard wasn't designing most of the buildings in Harlow. Very, very few he actually designed a residential block of flats, the uh, original town hall that we'll shortly see. Um, this uh, brand new station for the town was uh, built, uh, was uh, designed by the British Rail, British Railways, of course, at the time, Eastern Region Architects team, uh, when the uh, line was electrified in uh, uh, something like 60 years ago now. Uh, it is a listed building now. It's being praised, it's listed for its powerful spatial qualities. Um, for us, it's the start of this uh, 14 mile walk. So this is where we would have been gathering um, if I had treated you to 14 whole miles, uh, which would have been a bit of a route march and would have needed, I think, probably all of Midsummer's Day to have uh, uh, been completed satisfactorily. I wouldn't recommend 14 mile walks to look at Harlow sculpture, but we can do it through the miracle of technology. Um, the town station is not actually in the town. Uh, the town is uphill. It's not massively uphill. Uh, the station's about 100 feet lower than the town centre. So, but it is, it is a mile and it is a bit uphill, but it's quite pleasant because it's in a green wedge. Um, most of the major roads of the town um, are uh, certainly separated from pedestrian and cycle routes that we mentioned. Gibber was miles ahead of his time in that regard. Uh, and uh, we'll have a nice broad avenue to walk up before we get to the central shopping area and it's time to look at some sculpture. We're going to go to the market. Market isn't all it was, I'm afraid. Markets aren't these days in many respects, but it does have uh, Ralph Brown's uh, bronze, uh, one of the earliest pieces of, of work to uh, become part of the Harlow collection situated in the market square. It's very visceral piece of work. Uh, Ralph Brown obviously taking uh, lessons from Rodin about how to display not only the human figure but also the carcass here. Indeed, um, once upon a time this is going to be called figures with a carcass. Um, there's no doubt there about what the activity is. Uh, Gillian Whiteley, the, uh, the critic, called it uh, very much uh, uh, showing the keen social engagements with a sometimes dark, disturbing sensuality that uh, uh, Ralph Brown would exhibit in his work. I clicked too quickly on a piece in the main shopping area by uh, Lynn Chadwick. Uh, this is a, a male Lynn, not a, a female Lynn. And again, those of you who have the pre-read will be able to see the potted biographies I've done. So I'm not going to give you many potted biographies of the sculptors because all those many are well known, others are not. Um, but uh, uh, um, Chadwick was, was one who, who rarely made a maquette of the work. He, he, he uh, very much just 
worked directly with the material. Um, it, it's, it's not so representational, of course, in, in many ways, uh, as, as was the, the, the Meat Porter's piece. But I do like uh, the contrast. The, the, the roundabout isn't always there. Um, but I think in this particular uh, photograph of it, it, it gives a, a very um, a nice uh, um, uh, disjuncture, if you like, with the everyday life of the town. Um, it's by no means the only place in uh, the only piece in the in the Broad Walk. Uh, there's a piece by Paul Mason, out of, made out of marble, and there's also a structure by Gibbard himself, who by no means con considers himself to be a sculptor, uh, but he did make an obelisk specifically for that area, and they are all still there. Um, the shopping area is only uh, around the corner from the town hall. Uh, that's what the town hall was. I believe it was a Gibbard building. Uh, it was intentionally placed on some of the highest ground so that it would dominate the landscape. Um, and strategically outside, and you can see it at the bottom there, was a piece by Henry Moore, you know, one of the great figures of 20th century um, sculpture. Uh, Gibbard and Moore knew each other well. Um, uh, we'll talk more about that later, but this piece, which we'll see in greater detail very shortly, was um, if there is an icon for Harlow, it is Henry Moore's uh, family group, and there it is. Now, the building, alas, and I have to say it is somewhat uncompromising as a piece of 60s architecture, 50s architecture, um, suffered from concrete cancer uh, and uh, needed to be demolished in the early 2000s, or so about 16, 17 years ago now. So there is a very different uh, civic centre now, and it's this. Um, I, now, my personal view is that it's a, a better looking civic centre. It's by a large uh, practice, international practice called Benoy. And I like this side of it because uh, it, it's got, a, to me at least, it looks quite a lot like, quite a, like, a lot like the uh, Royal Festival Hall on the South Bank. There are, to me, seem to be clear borrowings in this detailing here in the curve of the roof. It declines in quality to the, what is, to the right on your view, and we'll see that in more detail later on. Um, but this this is the town bit, uh, the civic bit, and to the right is the uh, commercial bit, and just how commercial it is, we'll see very soon. Uh, inside is the Henry Moore. It's not outside anymore, um, and there's a reason for that. Um, the reason is, um, that uh, children used to like to play on it, uh, which uh, stressed out the sculpture somewhat. So it's now behind glass, but well viewed. Um, there is another Henry Moore in France, up, up, up right to motive number two. And in uh, front of the uh, uh, Civic Centre um, are the water gardens, which again, we'll be able to see very soon with more work. Uh, so it's, um, it's a significant site. Uh, there's a blue plaque to Gibbard there and further along out of sight, there's a blue plaque to Charles Cow, who is um, a, a Nobel Prize winner in physics for work done within the town of Harlow in the early 20th century in fiber optics. So the town has some significant claims to fame. Um, we, we'll, we'll go inside and have a look at the family group. There it is in its greatest detail. Uh, there are more made series of works on a common theme. Uh, this particular one is, I, I think it, it can be called the final iteration from a series of bronzes on the same theme that had a man and a woman and a child. Um, all grouped closely together. The first of them, in fact, was for another new town. It was uh, um, a bronze and uh, it was placed in the foyer of 
a uh, secondary school in Stevenage, where I understand it still stands. So, so Moore was working very much with uh, the idea of the new town firmly in his mind at that time. Um, it's uh, Derbyshire limestone, uh, form of limestone. Um, you can see in the right hand corner, some stairs will be taking them soon. Uh, the reason it's placed inside now is that children like to play on it. Well, well, you would, wouldn't you? That's a mother and a father and a child. And, you know, it might well mimic your own family situation. Uh, I know families are quite complicated these days, and they're probably pretty complicated in the 50s but, uh, and the 60s, but uh, I have it on good authority, no better authority than my next door neighbour. I live, by the way, in the first village outside Harlow, so Harlow is somewhere I go to a lot. Um, children like to play on it, and in particular, they like to cuddle the little child who might have been the same sort of size as they were. And in course of time, the poor little boy's neck, because he is thought to be a boy, we don't really know, was worn away so much that the head fell off. Um, it was at that stage that I thought they needed to do something uh, a bit more significant with the sculpture. And after the head was <laughs> reinstated, um, after having been uh, lost, uh, and found in a student's home, um, it uh, was placed back and I'm pleased to say it is now there and has undergone a recent renovation alongside several other of the important works in the collection and will, I'm sure, grace the town for many years to come. Um, Gibbard uh, was a collector of art, um, had been since he was a young man, uh, and set a number of criteria uh, as to the sort of works he wanted to collect. And in course of time, he donated those works to the town of Harlow, and we will go to them up the stairs on the right. Um, oh, there's a quick little picture, by the way, of more with the family group shortly before it was uh, donated to the town. Uh, we'll go up the stairs into the Gibbard Gallery, as it's now called, uh, which has a, a lovely collection of works, uh, all of which the, his criteria, Gibbard's criteria were the artist had to be alive, had to be British, and it had to be uh, not an oil, essentially. He did not want to collect oil paintings. It's a water, they're watercolours, they're drawings, they're pastels. Um, and I'd just like to show you some of the works because had we been meet, meeting uh, in real life, we would have had the opportunity to go into the gallery. It's alas, currently closed while the restrictions are in place. Uh, this is a piece by Dame Laura Knight. My personal favourite is a piece called Deer Fence by John Nash, who eventually settled in Essex. I love the sculptural quality of this. Uh, there is the deer fence. I'm presuming this is Scotland. I walked extensively in Scotland and I can imagine the sort of location this is. As the fences are sculptural, they divide things. The gulch is sculptural there, there's good coloration. So it's good quality work. Um, but apart from uh, the, uh, the watercolours, uh, there are also architectural drawings by Gibbard himself. And that one on the right is one of his drawings for the Liverpool Catholic, Catholic Cathedral. Uh, and you can start to see some of the le level of detail that he was putting in to uh, his architectural commissions. Um, you think it's just about designing a grand outside. No, you have to have every detail right. And of course, it would have had to be signed off by the church authorities as well, which I imagine had quite a lot of toing and froing as well. If you haven't seen the pre-read, by the way, I'll just briefly say that not only did he design a Catholic cathedral, he designed a non-conformist chapel in Lincoln, and he designed the London Central Market Mosque in Central in Regent's Park. So he's a man that is quite happy working across a variety of religious traditions. Back into the water gardens, uh, outside the town hall, which you are the civic centre, which you will recognise. There are two levels of water, only one of which is seen here. There's another down to the left there. Um, this is the commercial end, much less distinguished architecturally. 
with uh, Pizza Express, etc. Uh, there are statues, there are sculptures, Hebe Comerford's bird, Elizabeth Frink, another very important figure in uh, British sculpture is, is here with her boar. Uh, and uh, in the level below, there are uh, reliefs as well uh, within, um, within the waters. So it's a very attractive location. Unfortunately, when the uh, water gardens were uh, commissioned, uh, as I think I mentioned on an earlier sl slide, they put new supermarkets in either side that weren't there before, which ruins the visual aspect from the Civic Centre, but I suppose planning gain is planning gain. Um, the mo people know more, people know the likes of da Dame Barbara Hepworth that we'll be seeing later, uh, they certainly know Rodin as a significant figure in the history of European sculpture. And there's a Rodin as well acquired for the Harlow Art Trust. Uh, worth saying the Harlow Art Trust is in charge of the sculptures. It's not a function of the town council. Um, and there's a piece outside Five Guys Burger Bar and this coffee joint. Um, and it's wonderful as a town. Uh, such as Harlow can have the opportunity in one location of Comerford, uh, Frink, Moore times two, and Rodin. Uh, this is a, you could go to the VNA and be pushed to get a uh, collection of that quality in such a short, small space. That's the town centre. We're going off now um, to a more workaday place, the district of Bush Fair. It's about a mile, but we'll go. We'll use one of Gibbard's original off-road paths. Uh, watch out for the cyclists, but there's as many walkers as there are cyclists. Sculpture in public places is is sometimes problematic um, because people covet it; they want it for themselves, and we need to talk about this because it's relevant. Um, here is an example. Uh, in the library in, the, in this area, uh, there were two pieces by Leon Underwood, known as the father of British sculpture, the generation be before Moore and others. Uh, this rather nice piece called The Sower and another called Self Encounter. Were, alas, not secured well enough because they were stolen. I, I presume, nobody knows, I presume that they were stolen because uh, a collector wanted them, whether it was a local or whether it was someone who couldn't be bothered to go to the art market in the usual way. We will never know because it's an unknown uh, fact to this day, but uh, sculpture in public places puts those, has those risks. Um, happily, there is other work. And, and, and this is uh, an interesting one in the shopping area. This is, this is a, a local shopping area, it hasn't got big shops, it's got local pharmacy, etc, etc, takeaway joints, etc, I'm afraid these days. Um, well, I shouldn't sneer, I sometimes use them. Uh, and there's a piece by uh, Shelley Fawcett, um, another uh, more assistant, called Six Cubes, um, which is sort of minimalist and sort of not. It's minimalist in concept, it's six cubes, without a plinth. Very little work in Harlow has no plinth. Uh, Harlow's sculpture is not on the best plinths imaginable sometimes, they're adequate, but um, the faucet is, is simply out of the ground. Um, and it's called six cubes, but they're not. You might be able to see um, that there are um, differences between the cubes, that there are uh, working marks on the cubes, uh, that they are not necessarily all precise cubes. Um, there are other questions raised, of course, about art in the public space. If this is where you go to pick up your prescription every week, how much do you recognise that the sculpture is actually there? Uh, it, as I understand it, it's an unresearched area in a town like Harlow. It's probably quite well researched for the major collections um, in uh, the major tourist spaces. Uh, but in a town like Harlow, I am not aware, and I'm speaking to people who should know, that there has been research of that type. 
Um, and I think it, it's probably relevant, but do you spend money on research or do you spend it on buying or more, more sculptures or keeping up sculptures that you have? Uh, but I think it's a, an interesting and challenging piece uh, because it sort of is between uh, two fields. It's between minimalism and it's between the traditional concept of a bronze. And, and, and uh, whether people look at it and, and, and take from it different things in different lights, I honestly don't know. But it's there and if they want to be challenged, they can. We're three miles in. We've been up from the station, past the water gardens and all the other... Um, um, paraphernalia of the town centre. We've done this walk uh, on cycle path, uh, shared path, before going into Bush Fair. Uh, and we're now on our way to the Commons. Um, Harlow has its own green belt, um, uh, and the Commons are part of it. And I have to say, there are risks to the green belt. Uh, to the north, but so that's not the subject of this discussion, so we better move on. Uh, we're going on to the commons, and the commons are very nice, very pleasant areas. The, there's plenty of housing backing onto them, but they are genuine common land. Um, Latin Common and Harlow Common, they're called. They were there before Gibbard, and they were, all, they were there very much there after Gibbard, and they're a pleasant interlude in two miles that we have to walk between Mark Hall and Church Langley. Uh, and they provide grazing for this, to this day for travellers' horses. Nobody minds, the horses are there. They seem to be well enough tended. I'm afraid they are on tethers, but they're very long tethers uh, because travellers don't want their horses not to be there, or more particularly, probably don't want their, uh, their horses to be knocked over on the roads that abut the cons. So they're there, and I uh, walk that area frequently enough and would have been very pleased to have taken you over the commons in due course. But we're going to go to my local supermarket. I do a lot of my shopping at the Church Langley Tesco's. So we would have a little break here if you needed to get uh, that last minute bottle of milk for a cup of coffee tonight when you got home. Um, every time I go to Tesco's, I see uh, this wonderful bronze horse by John Mills. John Mills is one of our principal um, memorialists. Amongst other work, uh, he was given the commission for the uh, piece next to the cenotaph in Whitehall, um, at the memorial to the women of World War II. I have issues about giving such a commission to a man, but perhaps 10 years ago, people didn't think about that so much but anyway he's a major major sculptor still with us uh, works in Hertfordshire in fact not uh, next door county to Essex um, it was inspired by images from the Tangden Sea it's probably in all honesty as far away from a, a traveller's horse as you can get um, but uh, it's got a marvellous paddle for a tail uh, which is almost an umbrella this is one of those scorching hot days I took this a um, couple of months ago. Um, you can see the Tesco's branding. Uh, the, the shop itself is just behind. And again, you know, it's a workaday area. And I love workaday areas to have non workaday pieces next to them. The um, uh, next, next door, just you see the post box, you keep walking through the car park, you get to the Florence Nightingale um, Health Centre. Um, and the local sculptor, Nicola Burrell, produced this work uh, about 10 years ago to sit outside Florence Nightingale Medical Centre. Uh, there's Nicola Burrell, and there's the piece. Uh, I, I've been trying to interpret this piece for quite a long time. Uh, the closest I can get is this might have been a representation of the Trigon in the boardwalk that we saw earlier. Um, and that that might have been the lawn block of flats, perhaps. There is a Church Langley spire. Um, I don't think there is a spire on Church, Church Langley, but there are spires elsewhere on uh, some, some of the earliest buildings, of course. Some of the buildings such as churches were remained in situ. Um, 
She was very, very proud. Um, and it's a nice, colourful piece, but it's made out of steel. And this is an issue when you commission pieces. Um, it, it hasn't weathered well. Here it is now. Um, it, it, it is not looking grand. When uh, nine of the principal sculptures were renovated 10 years ago, the family group, the market, Porters being two, two of them, uh, the meat porters being two of them. This was not on the list. When you've got a hundred sculptures as, uh, as uh, Harlow does, you can't renovate everything at one time. There are genuine questions about this. I mean, should you be renovating them all the time? Should you be repainting a piece like Newtown all the time? Or should you simply let it weather? Now you will see a piece later that has weathered, and I think, it should be allowed to weather. This, I think, loses quite a lot. And I have to say, it doesn't help the image when the original explanation, uh, I have since found out what the original explanation was, that this represents the four broad geographic communities of Harlow, um, that it's gone um, and has not been replaced uh, for some months, uh, at least. And uh, don't forget, this is a piece I see regularly. So, so um, I, I do want to praise Harlow sculpture a lot, but I do want Harlow, to, I know Harlow recognises the challenges that some of the work presents and uh, a piece in painted steel is always likely to uh, show a bit of a challenge. Round the corner almost from uh, the medical centre is New Hall. We won't look at, we haven't looked at March architecture, but here's some domestic architecture. This is the Sterling Prize uh, nominee that uh, I referred to earlier on. New Hall is the most recent of the town's residential areas. It wasn't actually envisaged by Gibbard, but it's a sensible little bit of infilling. It, it doesn't sort of break the green belt. Um, it's still under development. This is some of the first housing that uh, was developed in an area called Newhall B. Um, Alison Brook Architects. Uh, Alison Brook's architects had won a few years previously the Sterling Prize for some rather more expensive houses in Cambridge. Um, Will Comperts, you can see the quote there, is the BBC art critic. Uh, and he gave uh, this particular um, uh, description of how those work. Uh, now, this is a, a recent photograph, uh, literally last week, I think, um, and you can see they look in reasonable condition. Uh, there is some planting. Um, he refers to um, sensitivity to the aesthetics of the region. I would really like to know how much the inhabitants of the houses are aware of. Maybe they've got a subliminal recognition that as they drive around Essex, they come across many uh, wonderful barns. Essex does uh, barns, large farms, very well. Uh, Pevsner rates, uh, Pevsner is the prime architectural historian of the UK, probably. Um, and uh, he rates barn architecture in Essex very highly. And it's you, the barns are usually black. And they usually have a roof pitch, uh, a very steep roof pitch, something like that, although not maybe the asymmetric um, non-guttering that you see there um, and uh, you know I've walked around Essex enough to have written a book about the county so uh, I know this uh, whether it's subliminally recognized by uh, people who live there um, again research would be useful there's a great study there uh, may, maybe anyone who wants to do a PhD in uh, urban architecture should really start looking at places like this. Um, uh, still in New Hall, uh, but on to sculpture this time. Uh, here's an interesting piece in sort of New Hall's village centre, if you like, uh, by the Norwegian sculptor Eckhard Altenberger. <clears throat> I do not know enough Greek to know whether this is sof sofrosine or sofrosine. Um, I'm going to use the latter, but if there's anyone who knows ancient Greek better than I do, then they will have to keep their ears covered while I continue. It was commissioned to commemorate Lady Gibbard. Uh, uh, Gibbard was married twice. His first wife died, and shortly after, he, he married uh, Patricia Gibbard. 
um, uh, in 19, about 1970, give or take a year, I can't remember. Um, and uh, the, the Sophrosyne concept, as I understand it, refers to an ancient Greek philosophical concept, <clears throat> always a moot point, not just in sculpture, uh, whether you need to know that level of story before you appreciate the work. Uh, what you don't see, and of course, what you don't see from any of this, these are photographs, some of mine, some from the uh, Harlow Art Trust site, um, but uh, you can't walk around, you can't appreciate. This is a stunningly beautiful piece of Norwegian stone. Um, I, I have to presume, I've, I've, if you search the internet enough, you will find a wonderful arc, uh, interview with with uh, Lady Gibbard uh, after she in her turn was widowed uh, about the early developments of the work of, of the sculpture in Harlow. Um, it has, a, it has a, a partner. There is uh, a partner in Guatemala and I know we have an international audience tonight. I do not know if we have a Central American audience but if we do it might be worth taking a trip if not Covid it, to uh, the Guatemala, Guatemala, Guatemala City Museum of Contemporary Art, because there is a partner piece to Sofrosin A1, which I, I think is rather nice because it's as different a setting, I guess, as you could find to uh, Newhall in Harlow. Right, okay. Um, Newhall is still being built. So our virtual walk, our real life walk between Newhall and Old Harlow would be partly through a building site, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, there are dedicated paths, so hopefully our footwear won't get too mucky. And we'll go into Old Harlow. I'm not going to show you Old Harlow. It looks like a small uh, Essex market town uh, with um, a number of older buildings. Um, there's this rather splendid bronze by Betty Ray, um, who was a noted educa educationalist for her work at Homerton College in Cambridge and, and other places, and was also uh, a dedicated uh, socialist, had uh, been deeply involved in anti-fascist work before and indeed after the Second World War. Uh, this, this was not made for Harlow, most of the work that you see has been made for Harlow, but some of it was brought in. This is brought in because Old Harlow won a Council for Europe award, which is a wonderful thing to have happened. And it's a very delicate little figure um, in uh, one of the main shopping streets uh, of Old Harlow and really couldn't fail to be noticed. It's perhaps unfortunate it's against such a bland brick wall. But uh, it's there and uh, it's a lovely piece. Where are we? We've gone from the station through the water gardens, Bush Fair. There are the commons at the bottom. Uh, the Tesco's and the halls are here in Church Langley. New Hall walk through. That looks like blank land, but it's being developed into Old Harlow. We've just seen Betty Ray's core. Uh, and now we're going to go another bit of blank land, which is infilling. Um, there is a uh, rather bland uh, Barrett Taylor Wimpy style development. In all honesty, it's not as bad as it could have been, but it is bland compared to New Hall, and frankly, bland compared to some of the uh, original housing sites of, of, um, of Harlow. Uh, but we're going to go to the Gibbard Guard. Uh, <coughs> Gibbard and Lady Patricia, retired here. Um, they, they became, the uh, well, Gibbard became the only uh, new town planner to retire to his own new town. So he was confident enough to say, yeah, this is where I want to be. Now, admittedly on the edge of town. Um, he uh, purchased a somewhat rundown small holding with an even more rundown uh, house. Uh, house apparently was only just the term for it. Um, and give us an architect. <laughs> he would like to design a house that he was going to live in. Um, it's a strange 
feature of Gibbard's life that um, he'd only previously designed one single house in his entire career. It was the very first piece he ever did, and it was for his mother. Uh, everything else was corporate buildings, airports, cathedrals. Um, he wanted to make himself a, a house. So he said to Harlow, I'm living in this rundown tip. Please can't I demolish it and put something else up. And they said no, which I think is rather sweet. It does prove that at least once upon a time, the developer couldn't buy what the developer wanted. Um, not necessarily something that you can say of uh, the developer's life these days when they have the ear of uh, those in power to perhaps an unhealthy extent. Um, there we are, great collectors. And well, did he knock it down? No, he didn't knock it down, but did he play around with it? It's a very different house, I understand, than what it was once upon a time. Um, high ceilings, pretty cold in the winter. Um, you can go around it on, uh, or you could pre-COVID, uh, on tours of the town that the Harlow Art Trust run, ran. Um, Otherwise, it's, it's kept as pristine as it can because it's quite delicate inside. But you can go into the garden. You can go in on Sunday, if you want to, uh, into the Gibber Garden because it's open twice a week until, I'm not sure it's the end of this month or the end of next month. Um, it's volunteer run. And it is the garden very much of uh, Frederick and Patricia Gibbard. Um, <clears throat> they devoted, certainly after Gibbard had retired in the late 70s, um, they devoted a lot of time to uh, pr producing a sculpture garden in their, in the grounds of their home. Here's one view of it with, that's quite a small piece, it's uh, I think less than the height of, a, of me. Um, it's um, Gilda Rubenstein City. Um, there was a larger version, a big, well over the height of me, version of City uh, in the town centre, and it was stolen. Uh, and it's uncertain whether it was stolen because people wanted to melt it down, uh, which has happened to some major pieces by Henry Moore in Henry Moore's own sculpture garden, which is only 10 miles from Harlow if you want to make a de double header. Um, but uh, yeah, it was stolen. It might have been sold to. to to, to melt down. It might have been stolen because it was, to put it mildly, one of the more controversial pieces. It's a very in-your-face piece of modernism. Um, surprising because Gilda Rubenstein has a lot of work. She's probably the most represented sculptor in the uh, Harlow collection and most of her work is figurative, including the uh, a, a bust of Gibbard himself, which is in the notes that you might have seen. Um, uh, that if you like, the Gibbard Garden is sort of a microcosm of Har Harlow. <clears throat> in Harlow, Gibbard tried to compartmentalise the town into distinct areas. Well, he does the same with the Gibbard Garden, and he uses a water feature. He used the River Stort to give a northern boundary to the town, and he uses a, a tributary of the Stort called the Pincy Brook, uh, which uh, to uh, define the garden. He allowed water into the garden um, for uh, um, uh, a miniature castle um, to play King of the Castle games, which is quite fun. Um, but we're going to look uh, elsewhere in the garden at um, some uh, classical work. Well, it's not actually uh, Greek originals, but there we have Greek style columns and Greek, Greek style uh, work there, uh, forming a key pivot point, if you like, on the garden um, in one of the rooms. Um, well, you may remember Coots Bank in the Strand, and you may remember that uh, there were, um, pro I, well, I think 18th, maybe 19th century porticos either side, and glass in between, and the glass is the gibbard, and either side is not gibbard. Well, uh, there is some of uh, what was there before in Gibbard's garden. It wasn't exactly a late one night on a 
two guys on the back of a lorry job, but he did make sure he had some of some some of the the uh, um, the, the work in front of that used used to front um, the site removed for his own use, which I think is a, a bit cheeky. But um, now, yesterday, coincidentally, I was visiting the Garden Museum in Lambeth, which is worth doing. And much to my surprise, one of the display areas was about Gibbard and his uh, work on the Gibbard Garden. It's that highly regarded. Um, it was defined by a good friend of his, Hugh Johnson. Hugh Johnson is, uh, was a wine writer, and to have a good friend as a wine writer seems to me a good idea. Um, Johnson called the, uh, the garden first and foremost entertainment. So if you want to go to a garden and be entertained, uh, do choose to give a garden. Unfortunately, you can't uh, go into the cafe at the moment, it's a bit of a shame, but you can certainly uh, have a nice walk around. Um, Okay, uh, yes, it's, it's one of the few grade, uh, few listed 20th century gardens. Certainly, it may well be the only postal listed garden. There aren't many of them. Right, uh, well, it's time to start walking back. We're going to walk back along the river. Uh, as I mentioned, it was, uh, it's a navigation, it was canalised in the 1760s, really quite early, one of the earliest. Uh, still, still carries pleasure traffic, has a towpath, and we'll be walking along the towpath. And, um, well, uh, it's Harlow, so there's a sculpture trail. Uh, here's one of the pieces. Um, it's uh, Anthony Lysitia, uh, another local sculptor. Uh, uh, man may come and go, but the river goes on forever. It's quite fun to spot the sculptures. There's only five of them along, but it's also quite fun as we walk along the river to go into the town park. Now, town park, almost like the Gibber Garden, has a variety of areas. Uh, it has a hay meadow, um, and here's a group I prepared earlier. Um, it might have been like this, folks. Um, it's a big town park designed by one of the uh, of Britain's premier of her day, um, uh, landscape architect, Sylvia Crowe. Um, uh, there's, there's this quite wild area and there's also more formal laid out grounds. Um, there's even, well, it's not actually a youth hostel. It's not part of the YHA, but it's a member of the International Hostels Association. If you want to stay somewhere in Harlow that's not, um, a uh, travel lodge or similar. Uh, but it's ever so well regarded. It's a very lovely open space. And uh, was, this is one of the top 10 green flag open spaces in Britain in just the last year. So it's well looked after, I'm pleased to say. Um, we, we won't be on the stalk forever. We're going to just knit back in, if you remember from the map, to the area of Mark Hall where the um, Sally home was demolished to make way for the town. And it's mostly, it's, well, it's almost all low rise uh, buildings um, of the 1950s and 60s. <sighs> what do we see? Well, this is not Harlow. This is the Festival of Britain in 1951. Um, it is uh, a piece by Barbara Hepworth alongside more two great British sculptors of the 20th century, a piece called Contrapuntal Forms, and it was commissioned for the Festival of Britain, and it had a pride of place, such a pride of place, that it was given a big pedestal and placed next to the Skylon, which was the defining image of the Festival of Britain. Um, now, I was actually at the Festival of Britain. Uh, I was uh, um, born um, while it was on, so I must probably have been in a pram, but I was told that I went there. So my, my baby eyes might have just about recognised it. Um, now, there were many works commissioned uh, for the Festival of Britain. Alas, the Skylon did not survive, but contrapuntal forms did. And it was presented to Harlow. Uh, many pieces went to new towns. And Harlow decided to put it major work it may have been, Mark Harlow decided to put it, well, probably because it was a major work, in a, a workaday housing estate. Here it is now. 
if there's any piece that I grieve that I cannot show you in real life, it is this one, because I find this a profoundly moving piece to put in this setting, that it is not placed in a gallery or something of that nature, that it is a place where people can stand on their balconies and, and just look at. Now, again, lack of research. What do people know? It's, it's well known that people miss sculptures when they're not there in Harlow. Lots of anecdotal evidence. But the best anecdotal evidence I can give is that contrabandal performance is in good nick. Okay, it got renovated last year, but it doesn't get scratched. It doesn't get spray painted. It doesn't get uh, mucked about with. I like to think that it's because of the merit of the work that it, 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 it's two forms. In many of those flats, there are two people living. Um, it might be mother and child, it might be uh, couples, it doesn't really matter, but there are two people living. And here are two figures in very, you know, they are close to each other and people want to be close to each other. It has another layer of meaning, if you like, now when we can't always be as close to each other as we want. And there is a bit of a turning away as well, which is, or is it a turning to? There's a lot of ambiguity in this piece. It's, a, um, it's almost a cliche of modern sculpture that there are holes in the piece, but these are asymmetric holes. Um, light can go through those in different ways. Feelings almost, emotions can run through those in different ways. There are many layers of meaning that you can put on this piece. And I, I take a, a lot of pleasure in thinking that something that was chiseled out of a block of limestone um, in presumably Hepworth's um, uh, studio in Cornwall, also worth a visit, um, is now in such a wonderful location that uh, those lucky enough can see this every day of their lives. Um, 1953, it's getting off 70 years there. It's listed in its own right, by the way. Okay, well, we're near the end, which is just as well, because my timing's uh, okay, but I, I, I do have timings, and I'll endeavour to meet them. We go back into the town park briefly. Um, this, this is a children's paddling pool. Um, it normally has water in. It does not this year, alas, have water in. Um, it is a, another um, Irish piece, uh, uh, piece of Irish stone, this time by the... Uh, um, Sussex-based sculptor and um, letter carver, uh, Will Spanky, and you can see that if it were to be in water, you can see the, the fish shape. So a nice thing for children to cuddle. Unfortunately, it does, again, um, the, the risks, two children on a rock, which is probably even nicer, um, had to be removed because it was two children on a rock and the children had arms and legs and it got really poorly um, vandalised. Uh, vandalism may be too strong a word, it may have been play. Um, I have to say copper polyester is probably not the strongest of materials for such a site. Uh, kiddies are running up to it all the time. Uh, so, briefly back into the town park before we cross over our original route into Little Pondon, another workaday housing estate, serviceable enough, bit of a use of, of um, uh, uh, an incline there in, in placing houses, so it breaks up the monotony otherwise of the houses, and that's good. And as developers sometimes do, a competition was instituted for a piece for the estate. And I'm pleased to say it was won by a Harlow College student, Uvi Usher, now works at the University of Plymouth. Um, <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was designed. Now, um, Hepworth, of course, was chiseling her uh, contrapuntal forms uh, out of limestone. Uvi was writing a uh, computer program uh, because there is the computer program producing the stainless steel. Um, it's not the most profound work, but it's, it's a good serviceable piece reflecting on the continual waves of uh, people that come to live in, uh, um, in a new town. It's not too far from the river as well. 
Um, not that that has waves of quite this stature, uh, but it is sensibly made out of stainless steel. So one hopes it might um, live on longer than um, a painted piece of painted steel would. Okay. Well, it's not far to go. I want to show you Palmden Mill. It's a very nice site. Uh, this is uh, Harlow's creative space, um, the building on the right. It used to be a mill. Um, uh, the mill, there have been mills there since uh, the Doomsday Book. Um, this particular mill was put up in 1900. <clears throat> uh, obviously no longer mills, um, but there are many, uh, artists working there. Um, we'll see their work very shortly. Um, uh, and there is uh, a small gallery there as well. So we might, if we've been doing a real work, have had the opportunity to see a commercial gallery as well with some of the work. Um, uh, you may have even been able to buy some to take away with you, which would have been lovely. Um, Round the corner on our way back is work by two of the Palmden Mill artists, Alan Freeman and Karen Murphy. Alan Freeman is the blacksmith, did the raw iron. Karen Murphy is the glass artist, did the glass inserts. And we have to walk on this uh, before we go back to the station, not far away, you'd be pleased to know. Um, it's raw iron. Um, Alan Freeman, the blacksmith, must have known that it would become tarnished. And I think with a piece like this, you accept that it becomes tarnished because that's what raw time does. That's what it looks like. This is a, the photograph that I took um, when I was doing the Essex book, which was like uh, 20, um, about eight years ago, I think now, when the piece is relatively new. And this is the piece now, sort of seven or eight years later, um, and it's not in such uh, fantastic condition, but I, my view is that it doesn't matter in, in a way that it does for the burrow. It's the last bridge we have to cross over water, although it's only water when it's raining hard. Um, it, but we'll be able to see on the Harlow Fringe, we can have a look through the bird hide to see the stalk flood, flood meadows before making our way back to the station. And as we make our way back, we'll be thinking, what does the future hold for Harlow sculpture? 101 pieces of public sculpture, possibly getting towards the upper limit for what the Harlow Art Trust can manage. There are additional sculptures in the Gibber Garden held under a slightly different um, arrangement, but you know, dozens upon dozens, no collection like it in any town of anything like its size in Britain. Does it matter that residents don't always seem to be aware or concerned about their sculpture unless it goes? Does it matter that unless they're a developer who wants to commission a piece of their estate, that the Harlow Art Trust is not usually the charity of choice for businesses looking for a bit of um, kudos from their ben beneficial work? Uh, does it matter that there seems, uh, of course, hits the public purse for many, many years now, uh, that the public sector is not able to support these things in the way that might have to say Harlow Council has, has made a virtue of not overly sponsoring this. It's enabled that the Harlow Art Trust is, is an independent body and has the responsibility. I think that's a sensible um, uh, separation of powers because there is always the risk um, of, frankly, the Philistines running the show. Uh, and this is by no means party political because God knows there will be Philistines on any side. But there are great opportunities as well. The sculpture br town branding is relatively new. Um, and if it takes off, uh, then there are opportunities. I have to say they're modest, but there are opportunities for tourism. It's all sort of halfway between London and Cambridge. You can go and see work in Cambridge. You can go to Perry Green, Henry Moore, the wonderful Henry Moore garden and have a look around Henry Moore's house. Again, wait for COVID to go. 
that maybe business thinks that it's a cultured town. It's a town with many challenges, but you know, it's a place that values values things in in a variety of ways. And if you like, it's almost you know, because it's more civilized, it, it, it gives that sort of outlet. There are opportunities, there are threats. Um, the future may hold many, many things. Um, I, I hope that many of you will be able to make uh, a trip down. Um, there are wonderful resources, um, which on the final slide, I'm going to keep this slide up for a moment, but on the final slide, there's a brilliant website that shows you a lot of this work in more detail than I've been able to explain and shows you the other 83 pieces that aren't in this in this presentation uh, of a variety of styles. And again, I've tried to have a variety of styles. I've, had, I've tried to have uh, a variety of um, fame, if you like, from the Henry Moores to the UV Ushers. Uh, international sculptors, local sculptors, because it's important that in a diverse town like Harlow, that there is a diverse range of sculpture too, and a diverse range of sculptors. More work to be done on that, but I hope that that's interesting for you in the meanwhile. Right, <laughs> I've spoken for a very long time. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that questions have been flying back and forth. And uh, I think Kyla is going to moderate a short discussion, which I'll do my best. Uh, I am by no means an expert. I'm certainly no history of art graduate. I'm talking from a layman's perspective, but I'll do my very best to answer what you may have. Thank you so much, Peter, for that absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I'd particularly like to thank you for opening my eyes to a new way of considering sculpture. Like you, I've um, pondered many times on the almost typical holes and pieces of modern sculpture. And I've never considered the idea of emotion flowing through those, as well as light, which is just such an enchanting way to, to think of it. And the pictures that that conjured for me in my mind, I'd like to thank you for. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I think the, uh, the idea is um, uh, copyrighted by uh, his, the um, History of Art Department at the University of York, one oh. of whose virtual <laughs> courses I went on. But uh, a, a lot of the rest of it is actually my own work. Thank you, Peter. Brilliant. Um, I'd also like to thank Elise McGrain. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly there, Elise. Um, who's kindly pointed out that the Gibbard Garden and post-war registered gardens at Historic England has just completed a national thematic registration project post-war landscape and she has kindly shared that link with us um, just before I go on to the questions that as we so rightly say are flooding in Peter there are just a couple of things that I'd like to mention um, I'd like to invite everybody to our next virtual tour which will be a tour of Yorkshire by Dr Jane Grenville and that will take place on Thursday the 8th of October and we then have our next professional network event which will focus on women in STEM and that takes place on Thursday the 22nd of October Hopefully you'll have received your alumni e-newsletter within the past few days. Uh, details of both these events are in there. However, if you've missed that, we will include details of those events again in our follow-up email, which you should get within the next few days after the event. So if I just turn back to the questions. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on. I'm just going to pull that up right. because I know both things are important. Oh, thank you, Peter, for reminding me. So. Um, as you'll know, everybody, this evening's event was free to attend. And again, hugely grateful to Peter for giving his time as well for free, for volunteering to his time for this event. If you would like to make a donation to the Emergency Student Support Fund, details of how to do that are on your screen now. Uh, this fund is just carrying out most crucial work. As you can imagine, um, students are one of the groups who has been most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the work that this fund is able to support in helping those students who face crisis is absolutely phenomenal. So if you're able, please do, no pressure, but if you can, we'd be hugely grateful. Um, so Christine has just said that as a York alum, born and bred, she's really enjoyed the walk as she was brought up near Epping. Catherine has asked, are partnerships with local businesses required for the commissioning of the artworks? Uh, the commissioning is done by the Harlow Art Trust, which I've mentioned is uh, a wholly independent body, Gibbard set it up in, I think, 1953, very early. Um, 
they um, they have a s small commissions budget, as you can imagine. Uh, the most recent piece uh, I mentioned, Charles Cowell, the um, Sir Charles Cowell, the Nobel Prize winner from the town, or at least who worked in the town. There is a new science park going up called the Cow Park, uh, and that was the recipient of the 101st piece. And I believe that the commission was uh, part of the development process for the site. So uh, you have instances like that, you have instances like Little Pondon. Um, I, I, I don't think anybody's expecting <clears throat> massive growth uh, now. It, it's got up to 101 sculptures um, and it's probably time now to take stock and maintain rather than massively developed, although I'm sure pieces will be added from time to time. Yeah. Which leads me neatly on to Catherine's next question, which is who funds the maintenance of the sculptures? <laughs> um, Harlow Art Trust, and that means that they have to go out with a begging bowl, and I mentioned in the threats that they don't, you know, they may get the occasional commission um, from uh, developers, etc., in the town, but they don't shell out for maintenance. Uh, the the most recent maintenance was of, it was mentioned, uh, um, pieces like meat porters uh, and contrapuntal form, some of the star pieces in the collection. Um, funds for their maintenance um, were provided through the Heritage Lottery Fund. And it's those sorts of sources that uh, they, ha they have to look to. But otherwise, nothing happens and and send, so you have things like the barrel happening. Mm. Um, Sam has asked me to pass on her thanks. She was joined us from Norway for this event um, and she described this as just being inspiring enough to pass that on to us. Uh, you asked earlier on if we had anybody joining us from South America. Indeed we do. Uh, we've got people from Peru, Chile and Mexico who've joined us this evening. So Most of those are quite a long way from Guatemala unfortunately. Yes, it might be a bit of a trek to look at the, the site, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. My Greek is worse than yours, I assure you. Uh, but yeah, it might be a bit of a trek to look at that one. Um, we've also had uh, alumni joining us from China, India, Russia, um, Norway, the Netherlands. So yeah, it's it's a truly international affair this really? evening. Um, Gabrielle has mentioned that she's not sure which website you were planning to direct us to. Um, uk. All right, okay, so she's recommended Art UK, who've been digitising all the UK public sculpture and suggested that people might like also to visit artuk.org and refine search by looking for sculpture in Harlow. And then apparently there's a dozen or so 360 degree images that are available on that site as well. Oh, okay. uh, there are also very good sites. Uh, if you just Google Gibbard Garden, and if you just Google Gibbard Gallery, both of those have sites which are um, uh, solely about those particular things. And in particular, the Gibbard Gallery site has got a good image of every single piece in the collection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, we've also had somebody commenting that this is perhaps a, a rather biased view of Harlow. Uh, they remember it as being slightly more anonymous. Um, <laughs> This is concentrated much more on the actual sculpture of Harlow rather than the town of Harlow itself, which I wouldn't want to offend any other Harlowins, Harlowins, Harlites, Hello, however. Yes. <laughs> so never criticise somebody's hometown, that's my motto. We won't go into it, that. It, you know, I, look, it's got a Labour Council and Tory MP, and they will probably both agree that the town faces many challenges. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it, it's on lists of deprivation. Uh, I think those are reasons to have uh, good sculpture rather than reasons to not have it. Absolutely, all the more reason for making that art as publicly accessible as possible, I would say. Definitely. So I think that draws our event to a conclusion for this evening. Thank you to everybody for their questions. And again, of course, to Peter for his time. We're incredibly grateful, Peter, um, to you for just not just the time this evening, but for all the preparation that's gone into this. Uh, I know that it can be, well, it would be for me, a nerve wracking experience, <laughs> but you've handled it like an absolute pro and I'm, I'm hugely grateful to you, Peter. Uh, Kieran just has mentioned that um, he spent his first 20 years in Harlow 
Uh, I'm regularly sat on the family group. <laughs> Good to see. You. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can accept total. One of many, I'm sure. <laughs> Fantastic. That's lovely. Oh, and Gabrielle has very kindly offered to arrange it for Stevenage public sculpture for us as well. So, Gabrielle, if you wouldn't mind contacting me directly um, at the email address that's up on the screen at the moment, I would love to take you up on that kind offer. That would be fantastic. So, uh, hey, yeah, pop me an email and, and we'll get that organised. So, don't forget, everybody, next event, Thursday, the 8th of October, Dr. Jane Granville, uh, Granville Tour of Yorkshire. And then the 22nd of October for our ProfNet. But in the meantime, thank you again, Peter, and stay safe and well. It's been a pleasure. I hope it's been valuable. It has indeed. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. Bye.